All right, we're going to work on exercise 5.3. And um, this has us build three different functions. And it says, write the following functions and provide a program to test them. So the first function re returns the first digit of the argument, the last digit of the argument for the second one, and returning the number of digits in the argument. So for example, <coughs> if I run first digit and send the number 1729 to it, the first digit is one. If I run this function, last digit, it's going to return nine. And then if I run this one, which just counts the number of them, it returns four. Now, these are not very difficult to do, by the way. Um, so this will go kind of quick. Uh, so let's jump over to Spider. I am going to go ahead and create a new program. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, both in the code and the console. I'm gonna go ahead and do a save as to get this saved right away. And I'm gonna call it exercise five underscore three. And I am gonna use a, a main method to drive my program. So I just kinda wanna get you guys in the habit of doing that. It's not really necessary. But given the fact that we're calling functions, I think it works a little bit more smoothly if you know you're going to call a lot of functions to run them from the main program function. So let's define that first. So we'll have a, a function called main. There it is defined. And you know, uh, for right now, I'm just going to put one command inside of it just to have something in there. And then I'm going to press enter and what will normally happen here is once you have a function number, you press enter at, at the end of the line and it will automatically indent you. Spider indents for character spaces. When I complete the next line and press enter, it also moves me to the same spot. But <clears throat> we, if we're gonna run other functions or regular code, we have to get back to the margin. So I'm gonna backspace back to the margin. Otherwise, it's considered being inside the function. I think we, we talked about that last time. Now, because we're using a main function um, or method, you can call it, call it either thing, same synonymous term. Um, we want to make sure that at the very bottom of the program, we put in a call to run the function. Otherwise, the program won't do anything. All right. All right so that mechanism is in place. Now, I'm going to come back up here, and we're going to create another function called first digit oops Not sure what happened there i'm gonna say it the wrong key <clears throat> followed by parentheses and a colon and the instructions in the book have us sending something n for number in here when we receive that number the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to turn it into a string okay so now like that's kind of weird why would you do that well a number when I look at a number and I try to traverse it as a structure, I can't really do that. I mean, I can do it visually. So like if I have the number one, two, three, four, right? Just, and this is not code, by the way, it's just an example. I can't like just extract the two out of it. However, if I turn it into a string, we already learned how to do this. Well, then it's not a number anymore. It's a series of characters and I can extract any character I want and I can address any character I want using the same syntax that I do with a list, which is like, if I want to get the number two out of there, I would, you know, if this is a name structure, I would like inside of square brackets put two. So just for example, if num equals one, two, three, four inside of quotes, then num two would be this is not valid Python, by the way, would be equal to two, right? No, that's wrong. That's actually, what number would it be equal to? So this is the trick, it would be equal to three because it's position zero, position one, position two, right? So keep that in your head as we're kind of working. So our first step here, if we want to look at the first digit of a number is to convert the number to a string. So I'm just going to create a variable called string. And then we have a function called str, which takes any number and converts it to a string. So we'll send in the number, convert it to a string, and now I can look at anything I want in there, character by character. I'm looking for the first 
character. How do I access the first character in a string? Well, first I call in the structure, which is string. And I look at position zero. That's the first character, right? <clears throat> and then the function needs to tell us what that number is. And I'm just gonna return the value of first. Now, this is kind of interesting. <clears throat> and I had somebody ask me this last time because we're going to start with a number, <clears throat> but I'm going to return a string. So what if the person wanted to do math with that number? Not a, not a good solution then, is it? If the person's intending to do math with that number for some reason, <clears throat> this would be an alternate. You could do this. So instead of doing the stuff above, you know, so you would not do any of this. This would be a, a kind of like an exclusive statement. You could just simply take the string or the character in position zero of the string, right? And then convert that back to an integer and then return the integer, which then is a number. It still would print out the same, but I could do math with it, right? I'm just throwing that little comment in there so you guys understand why I put it in. Now, we would need to test that, right? So with all the little functions that we write here, we're going to basically, we're going to push it right to a print statement. Testing. So we could say something like the first digit <coughs> of 1729, that was the number that we were given is right and you know what we're going to test some more numbers but let's, let's just run this and see if it works okay the first digit of 1729 is one all right let's try a couple more i'm just going to copy the statement by the way and just paste it in a couple of times and I'm, I am doing the function call right from within the print statement, and that's okay. Uh, but let's change the numbers up a little bit. What if I only throw one number in there and the number is four? And what if this one's got three numbers that are all the same? Let's run those. But you see that it is accurately pulling in the first digit no matter what it is. So that I would call that working. Another way we could do this, I'm going to kind of show you a combination of weird techniques here, is I could instead run first digit, store the value, and then print that value. That's a possibility. So for example, I could just come up with a num variable. Maybe I'll call it num1. Um, and num1 will store the result of first digit running. And you know you can put whatever number you want and I just slid my fingers across the keyboard. <laughs> it doesn't really matter what the number is. Then once I have that number, then I could put it on the screen with a print command. So I could just do this, right? So I could print. Now I would suggest that you use some meaningful words here. Um, and you could, uh, for example, say first digit of eight, seven, six, five, four, three is num one. Right, so that would be one way. And let's run that just so you can see that it works. All right. Another technique, and we haven't talked about this, and I, I'm just kind of peppering this in for kind of enhancement, let's call it, is we can use this like weird other syntax that we haven't really talked about uh, much. And I know the book doesn't really press upon this, but I've been noticing that a lot of professional programmers, especially those that are starting to venture into like AI and data processing, use this alternate print command, which we call string interpolation. Um, and, and I'm gonna actually, um, let, let's put a comment in here and say, an example 
of using f for string interpolation. That's really kind of a long word. And, and what this means is like the way that we're doing this right now is we will put in some text, right? And then we use this comma and then we add the variable. Another way that we can drop text in, by the way, is I could also use a plus sign here. This is kind of weird, right? That kind of acts like the comma. I, I just want to run this and show you what, what the difference is. Uh, basically nothing, right? Except one thing. If I use, instead of the comma, which adds a space here, when I use the plus sign to print out, it doesn't. So if you look down here, then I have to add a, a space inside here. So what I'm going to say here is a comment on this one is using the plus sign is called concatenation or adding strings is what concatenation is. <clears throat> if you do that, but you must manually add any needed spaces and you know and, ch and check the output so now that i've added a space here right and i run it you will see that it will print out correctly right so one way to do it this is the way we first learned with the comma it adds the space for you right in that spot this is the concatenation approach where we're taking a string and adding it to another string you know and there's there's no math that happens there by the way it's just connecting strings <laughs> we call that concatenation um but you have to be mindful of all the spaces in, in the layout right so that that's why we had to add this this space here to make it work now in this final approach we're using a, another technique this is called string interpolation and what i've noticed um and I, I've seen this in a few different languages now. So, so the, this works in most major, major languages and they all have their own kind of unique way of doing it. But in Python, we add the letter F at the beginning of the string outside of the double quotes, but inside the parentheses, mind you. And then inside here, we can just kind of compose a more normal kind of sentence. So I could say um, the first uh, digit of, and you know, let's throw a number in there is now instead of concatenating or using the comma approach, watch what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna use curly brackets and I'm gonna use the name of the variable. And really I, I need to, I, well, okay. So I'm not really doing this right. Maybe I should use this number here because I have already calculated it. I just don't want it. I don't want to write the another snippet of code there, right? So we put this inside of curly brackets inside of the string so it just becomes part of the string and we call this string interpolation. So in other words, you need this F here at the beginning and then you can just drop the variable name directly in to the string. Now watch, watch the output. There's really no difference in output, right? Um, well, the difference here is I added the word the, whatever. Okay. But the variable becomes part of the string and for a lot of people, this is a lot easier because now you don't have to think about, well, if I use a plus sign, I need a space. If I do this, that takes care of it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you, here's just another way you can put stuff up on the screen. Um, a lot of modern programmers are using this technique. They just find it easier, right? Because the variable or whatever thing you're dropping into the string is just, it just drops right in, in stream. You just need the F and the curly brackets and then call the object. So you can see why that's kind of a, a nice little tool. Uh, so hopefully you guys are kind of latching on to that. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's move on to the, the next one. So the other function that we needed to write was one called last digit. Now you can imagine this is um, kind of uh, an, an interesting little problem, right? So let's, let's, let's build the, the structure first. And I'm going to show you a really, really clever mathematical way to solve this one. And I remember when I first saw a solution like this, I'm like, huh, that works. <laughs> so that, that was kind of like my 
thing. So watch the code on this. This is like so painfully simple. It it's it's mind boggling. Um, there it is. It's all done. <laughs> That's all the code for it. So what is this doing? Okay. So if you look at what this is doing, this will take any number and mod it by 10. So remember what modulus is. Modulus division is where we do the division, but we're not looking for how many times something goes in. We're looking for what the remainder is. Okay. So for example, if I sent in the number um, 10, okay, or, or how about one, two, three, if I mod one, two, three by 10, what's the remainder? Okay. Well, <clears throat> Okay, so if you're having a hard time conceptualizing that, that would be like saying, taking one, two, three, dividing it by 10, and, you know, what is the remainder, right? And once again, this is not code, by the way. And the answer to that would be 10 would go into 123 12 times, 12 times 10 is 120, right? And then you have a remainder of three, okay? So what's the last digit? Pretty clever, right? So this works with any base 10 number because we're in a base 10 number system. So you can take any number at all, throw it in there, divide 10 into it. That will isolate the last digit as a remainder. And so really, really um, clever uh, way to do it. Are there other ways to do it? Yes. Are they better than this? No. <laughs> All right. So what would be another way to do it? So if you just think about this, I could, and I'm just say, I'm just, just as an example here. So if you want to conceptualize this, I'm not going to actually write it as code, but you could, for example, take any number and look at its last position. So I could set up like, you know, um, you know, num one, or actually we would do the same thing we did above. So we could do a string, convert the number to a string and then we could take that string and then use that that weird syntax that we talked talked about which is the minus one syntax so i could come up with a variable called last and say string position minus one which looks at the last position in the string and stores it and then return that right so that would be an alternative and maybe <clears throat> maybe I should list it as such. And, and I could say, or we can do it <laughs> the hard way. And it's not really the hard way, you know. Um, maybe it's better to say, or you can do it this way, right? And either one of these would work. But I love this approach because mathematically it's brilliant because it's so darn simple. It's just built into the number system. So if I run this, nothing happens because I've never called it. So we have to call it from up here. But if we <clears throat> wanted to run this and I'm gonna do this in a copy paste fashion here. So you guys will have to type really quick. Now, if, if you're kind of clever, what you can do is you can take the stuff we did before, which says first digit and just replace it with last digit, use the same numbers. Um, and you run it and you can see the last digit is nine, one and five. So it is working correctly. If you wanted to practice your string interpolation, um, you could do that too. So we could say num two equals last digit and we'll throw in a, num a number, whatever it is. And then print with the F command for string interpolation and say last digit of 46464 is inside of curly brackets. That's, that's the string interpolation approach. So here comes the run and you can see that it, it does work just fine. So that's the first two function. Let's go on to the third. The third is to count the number of digits that we have. And that one's actually pretty darn easy because we have a function that's built into Python that basically does that automatically. So here is 
the definition of the function. We're just going to call this digits. Why? Because we they told us to, basically. Um, and we're going to do the same technique. We're going to take that number, run it through the string function, convert it to a string so we can tra traverse it. And so one approach, uh, there's multiple approaches here as well. <laughs> this is where it gets a little weird, is we can just run the length function and say, hey, what's the length of the string? And that will turn a number. You know? So if I put in the word hello, it'll say five, right? Um, so that, that's the easiest way that I can think of to do it. So I would recommend that this is the solution. And then of course, we would want to test the solution. Once again, I'm, I'm doing some lazy typing stuff. I'm just copy pasting in some calls here using the first approach, right? The first printing approach. We're calling digits with the three numbers that we've been using pretty regularly. And let's see if it's correct. Four, one, and three are all correct. All right, folks. So this is the solution for this exercise. This is exercise five, three from our book. We extract the first digit, the last digit of a number, and count the number of digits in the number. That's uh, exercise five three. You guys all good? Any uh, questions or problems? Anybody? All right, moving on to the next one. Next one is uh, exercise five five. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a new program here. Do a save as. I'm going to call exercise five underscore five. And then I'm, I'm zooming in. Here's the instructions. I just copied them in from the book. I'm just going to drop them up here. Oops. That didn't copy. One more time. Let's try that again. There we go. So it says write a function called def repeat, which receives a string a number n and a delimiter, and that the string returns a string re repeated n number of times. So you'll drop in a string, how many times you want it to repeat, separated by the string delimiter. And that's kind of another piece of terminology. We're getting lots of terminology today. So for example, if I throw in repeat, ho, three, comma space, then it'll print out a ho, comma, space, ho, comma, space, ho, <laughs> like that. Now, this is kind of an interesting piece of terminology. Um, and really, the, the full spelling of this is delimiter, like there's an E-T-E-R at the end of it. And that's a special term in computer science that we use to show what item we're using to separate values in complicated data structures. And, and for example, like if I was working in what I would call a comma separated text file, where I might have like, um, you know, a name, a last, a last name, um, maybe an address, you know, et cetera, phone number, you know, something like that. You know, we would call this comma separated values and the comma is the delimiter or the separating character, right? So that's where the terminology comes from. I just think that's helpful to know. So like when people are throwing words at you, you're like, oh, it's a delimiter, it's a separator. That's all it is. <coughs> all right, so we're gonna write this code also using a main method. So I'm, let's start by defining the main method. And We'll put in a, a nonsense print statement here just to have something. And then I'm going to add a couple lines, come back to the margin, go down a ways, and put in the main function call. Remember, without this, our program is not going to run. Um, we're going to make our program run in a way that we can prompt the user to enter a string, prompt them to ask how many times and then what their separator is. So we're gonna ask the user to put that information in. And so let, let's write that code. So let's create a um, variable called input string that's gonna grab 
input from the keyboard and we're gonna prompt our users and say, enter a string. And actually maybe it's better to say, enter a string to repeat. All right, so we're capturing that piece. Then we're gonna ask um, for a count. How many times do you wanna do that, right? So we're gonna do an input again um, and say, how many repetitions? And you know what? That that should be a number, right? So we should convert all of this to an integer if we want it to behave like one. So it'll come in as a string, but we're turning it into a number. And then we're gonna come up with a variable called delimiter. And this will be a string also, but we're gonna ask separated by What's your separating character, basically? So we're gonna capture all three of those things from our user. Then in order to run this, we're gonna call uh, a function that we're gonna create. Now we're, we're told what to name it and how it should look. I mean, it's right there. <laughs> so I'm not even gonna type it. I'm just gonna drop that in here. So there's our definition. We're gonna call it repeat. We're gonna send in our string, our count, and our delimiter. And I want you to notice, you know, I'm in the habit of not naming things in a function call the same as they are here in the main method. And this is just kind of old school um, hangover for me, if you if you will, because in the old days of coding, you never really wanted to make to make sure your your variables weren't getting polluted. You know, you're sending them around your program that um, you know, this is, becomes a different variable internally to the function, right? So that's kind of a habit that I have. I could hypothetically name them the same thing and they would be, um, it would work just fine. I'm just not comfortable with that because I've learned a different way, basically. So I'm gonna come up with a, a variable name here called return values. This is what I'm gonna send back to the program when I'm all done. What I'm gonna start with is I'm just gonna take the string that they typed in, the thing they want repeated, and I'm gonna put it in there. Then if I'm going to repeat a string on the screen, well, you know, we have tools in programming where we can repeat code. So I'm gonna use a for loop. And I'm gonna say for i in range, and we'll start with one, and then how many repetitions are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna go up to whatever the count is, the count came in on, in the second variable here called n. So we're gonna go from one to n. I want you to notice here that we're starting here with position one in the string. So this will be kind of an interesting thing. Will this work is the first question. Yes, of course it'll work. Now this is, this is kind of weird because we're not traversing a string here what we're doing is we want to output something a certain number of times. And if you remember how the for loop works, we'll never quite reach this one, right? So, <clears throat> so you usually set this one for one higher than what you want to do, but we're starting at the number one to begin with. So that kind of is like the correcting mechanism in it. And then to do the actual, um, process here what we're going to do so i want you to think about this if somebody types in the word ho right we're going to take that that's already stored here right and we want to keep adding to it but every time we add to it we want to add the delimiter it might be a dash or a comma or a space or exclamation point or whatever plus we want to add the string back to it <laughs> we already have one in the can. So you'll see my logic here in just a second. So we'll take that return value string and I'm gonna plus equals the delimiter, comma, space, whatever, and concatenate a, the string that we want repeated onto it. So the first time through the loop, we have two things in there. This is why this works, right? Otherwise I'd have to say n plus one, right? Okay, yeah, I think you're starting to see it, All right? 
after the loop completes, then we will simply do uh, a return of the return value, whatever we calculated, and that's the whole program, folks. All we need to do now is call it correctly. So we're gonna do a print command and we're gonna, right inside the command, we're gonna do a repeat, All right? We're calling the repeat function. <coughs> we're gonna send in what the user wants repeated, the number of times they want it repeated and the delimiter that they declared um, and I'm making sure I'm spelling that correctly for whatever reason, it, it doesn't, delimiter, is that right? Uh, I spelled it with an E, okay, whatever. There you are. Now, I, I don't, I'm thinking that that's not correct. So now, now, now I feel like I have to Google <laughs> that word. So I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna do it because hey, we're online, whatever. Is that the right way to spell that? No, it's with an I, how do you like that? Okay, so my instincts are right here. A delimiter is actually spelled with an with an I here, not not a big deal. It would still work, right? But I may as well spell it right. Now I do have a red indicator here. Oh, what did I forget here? Let's, and actually, let's look at the, the syntax. It says invalid syntax, right? And what am I missing? I'm missing the colon at the end of the function call. That, that was my mistake. Let's uh, save this, let's give it a run. Clicking over into the console, let's try the example. So I'm gonna type in ho, how many repetitions? Three, separated by comma space. And there you go, ho, ho, ho. And then you know what, let's try it again. Okay, whatever. How many repetitions? Uh, 23. Right, let's get kind of obnoxious with it and let's use that as our separator. There you go. Very, very useful code. But this really teaches you a lot about, you know, um, terminology, function, and, and really uh, kind of like pulling all of our skills together here, but also being able to pass in multiple values, strings, numbers, et cetera, doing something with it and then sending, you know, really what is kind of, uh, more complicated structure back, right? Because we keep building here. So we we start with this, and then every time we run through, we add the delimiter and another version, delimiter and another version, and it just keeps going until we hit the count. Um, and the count is a variable, right? So that could be 23 times. And if you want to really have fun with it, you know, you could, um, <clears throat> I don't know, you put in a much larger number if you want to get a chuckle out of it. So I did space dash space, and there you go. There's a, a thousand oops right there. But you can see how this might be useful. <laughs> I'm not sure what it would be useful for, but there's a list of oops a thousand long. All right, you guys all good? Now I'm going to pause the video here. All right, we're gonna work on exercise five, seven now, and here's the instructions for it. It says, write a function, uh, def count words, which receives a string that returns a count of all words in the string that you sent in. Words are separated by spaces. So for example, Mary had a little lamb should return five. So this is kind of an interesting strategy here, right? How do I know how many words are in this string? here? Well, I skip the first word and I start counting the spaces. There's one, two, three, one, two, three. So that gives me five. Hmm. It's kind of an interesting little problem. Okay. So like, how do you figure this problem? This is really kind of a weird little problem, but you know what? It is actually um, kind of a clever one because this tells you a little bit about natural language processing on the most fundamental level. So how do, how do I know how many words are in a string? Well, visually, I just count them, right? One, two, three, four, five, there it is. Um, and here I, well, I only counted three spaces, but really there's one, two, three, four. And, and this is an easy one to miss, right? So there's 
four spaces, meaning there's one word more than the number of spaces. And that makes sense, right? It, it, it sure does if you start, start to think about it. Okay, so let, let's try to build this in code. So let's come back to Spider, new program, save as, um, calling it exercise five underscore four, uh, zooming in. And once again, we're going to write a main function for this, just get in that habit. You don't, remember, you don't have to do this in a Python program. It's just considered kind of um, good practice. Nonsense placeholder there. I just do that on purpose just so I can get the main method typed in cleanly. And I'm also not a fan of like having some stuff indented and not because you know it can break your code. So, all right. So I'm going to come back up here <laughs> and start thinking about this. Um, we're going to let the user enter the string here. So let's do kind of the same thing we've been doing. So we'll have an input string and we'll prompt the user and say, um, let's have double quotes, of course, enter a string, please. Um, maybe a whole sentence. So in other words, type more than one word. This is gonna work well without. And then um, we're gonna to have to run the function to do the determination. So we need to write that function. So I'm gonna define a function called count words. We're gonna send our string to it, hopefully a sentence, and then we'll start to process it. Now, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna take that string and we're gonna run a command on it that they talk about in the chapter which is a strip method. And what this does, and this is kind of fascinating, is what strip does is it eliminates what we call leading and trailing spaces. And this is really kind of a weird command. This comes from form processing. So in other words, when people first used to write applications and you'd get like a user would like hop up on a screen. I'm just going to give you an example by going to Google. This is kind of a, maybe a primitive example, right? But normally, like if you type, um, I don't know, whatever, right? And I don't know if you guys are noticing how I'm typing this. The, the normal habit of humans who are really good at typing is you type a word and then your thumb on one hand or the other hits the space bar. It's like word, space, word, space, word, space, right? And it's pretty normal. And in fact, what happens with a lot of people is they do that so automatically, they don't think about it. But if the, somebody types in a sentence, think about this, and they typed in Mary had a little lamb space, this can break our algorithm. We don't want a space at the end. We call that a trailing space. We also don't want one at the beginning. So I, I made careful attempt here to type a space at the beginning, which we don't want, and a space at the end, because that would break the algorithm that we determine where the number of spaces is one less than the total number of words, right? But if you put a space before and a space after, well, that's off the table. The strip command was built to deal with form content. So for example, like if you go to a form and you type in your username, and this very ironically happens on a phone kind of automatically, like you type in your username and your phone drops a space in for you, right? Very normal kind of, um, and it's not an error, it's just what your phone does, right? So people who write code to process forms often use a strip command to eliminate the leading spaces and the trailing spaces. So that's what strips about and why we're doing it. We're using that, um, and I'm going to say it here. And actually, let's do it down here. The strip method moves leading and trailing spaces from the string. And in this algorithm, important, right? So that, that's why we're doing it. All right. <clears throat> now we need to do a little bit of logic. So we've gone in, and if there's a space at the beginning of the string and a space at the end of the string, we've removed those. Now, if, and this is something you might not think about, what if we have a snarky user? right? And the user's like, please enter a sentence. They just press enter. 
you know, so if the string is blank, we are just going to return zero. And I want you to notice a couple things here, right? It's like, uh, you might go, hey, Ty, I've never seen an if statement like that. Well, this is kind of a, a an allowable feature in Python. So normally we'd write an if statement like this, right? So we'd have the, the logical test, the colon, and then we move down um, to the next line. I'm noticing I, I misspelled return, so let's fix that. But it is also allowable that if you only have one statement, you can just put it directly after the colon like this. So a lot of Python programmers um, with really simple little things like this will just put it all in one line. Why? It's just easier you know, uh, and, and faster. Right. So if they sent in a blank string, we're going to return zero. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is this is not going to be our only return statement inside the, the function, right? So we 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 did a Kahoot on this uh, way back when, um, before the conference and the internet outage. Um, and there was a question on the Kahoot, you know, that said, uh, in Python, a function can only have like one return statement or multiples or whatever. And the truth is you can have multiples, but only one of them can execute. So in other words, what we're doing here is that we're going, hey, if this thing, if they didn't type anything in, let's just get the heck out of here. There's nothing to count, right? So that, that's that's why. Um, so the return statement will pop us out of the, the function. None of the lines below would fun, would process, basically, if, if the string was blank. All right. If the string is not blank, they managed to type at least something in. Well, for sure, we have a count of one already. There's at least one word in there. Might be a single letter, might be multiple letters, who knows, right? It's still a word. So we set our count to one. Then we'll run a for loop and we are gonna traverse the string character by character. So we're gonna say for character in string, we'll do the following. First, we'll check to see if that character is equal to a space, right? So notice I'm typing a space in like that, right? So if the character is a space, what happens? Well, remember, we're gonna add to our count. Given the fact that we already have one in the count, right? This is gonna count every space and then add one to it because we already have one here, right? And we have the, our word count. So, so if we encounter a space, our count will plus equals one. So we're adding one count. And then that loop will keep going until it exhausts the whole string, found all the spaces, adds it to the count, and then we will just return the count. So this should be accurate. Now we need some code to, to trigger it. I'm gonna use the string interpolation approach here. So, um, Let's just call, we have an input string, let's do an output string. And that's gonna be equal to count words of the input string. So whatever they typed in, we're gonna send it to the function. It's gonna process, it's gonna return a number and <clears throat> place it here. And really, maybe that's not the right word, right? It's not gonna be an output string, what is it really going to be? Well, we could say word count, maybe. You know, would be a good thing. Right? So that's going to be a number that it's returning here. And then let's just do a print command to put it on screen. We're going to use that F approach with string interpolation just to get a little practice with it. And we'll say the number of words in your string is... In curly brackets, and we're going to say word count. All right, that, that's all the code, folks, believe it or not. Not a lot of code here, but very powerful code. Um, you know, so like if you wonder um, <clears throat> how, like if you're like using Microsoft Word, for example, and, and actually I do have that product pulled up, and, and I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but like whenever you're using Word, 
Word keeps a tally of how many words are in your document automatically. Uh, where? Well, look at the bottom margin of Microsoft Word right down here. It's keeping a um, account. And I am in, it says protected use. I'll turn on the editing, right? So it keeps account of all the words on the page automatically. It just does it. There's some code in the background, just like the code that we just wrote, that's always counting the number of words. Why is this relevant? Well, if you ever take, uh, you know, an English course, especially on the college level, you'll get professors that go, hey, I want a 500 word essay, you know, minimum 500 word essay. Well, how, how do you know you've reached that count? Well, there, there you go. <laughs> it's right at the bottom of Microsoft Word. Uh, if you actually click on that in Word, you can actually bring up this little panel and it shows you actually even more details, you know, the pages, the words, the characters, characters with spaces or without spaces, paragraphs, lines, yada, 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 yada. What's kind of interesting is we'll, we'll learn how to write code that does all of that, you know, so that, that's kind of coming up uh, in our exercises, by the way. So, um, but just built into work, kind of, kind of fascinating that way. I'm not going to save that. Um, all right, let's, let's go ahead and run this and, and see what happens. All right, so here goes. Uh, please enter a string or enter a string, please. Maybe a whole sentence. All right, well, no, I'm not going to do it. All right, so it popped me out. You guys notice that? So number of words in your string is zero. So it ran the code. It got to this point and it returned the zero and stepped out. Okay, now let's try with some actual words in there. Let's see if this really works correctly. And so notice one, two, three, wait, here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven words should be the response and it is correct. Let's test it by putting in a leading space, a space and some nonsense. So there's a space, word, space, word, two words. I still got it right. Let's do it the other way around. Nonsense word, space, nonsense word, space. So a trailing space, handle that too. And let's try leading and trailing. So space, nonsense, space, nonsense, space still doing it correctly okay so pretty pretty neat so it's a combination of techniques here the strip command helps us so that's a really useful little command like if you ever write programs that are getting input from the user strip command is very commonly used all right folks that's all we have time for today in fact we're a minute over so thank you for being here uh i will publish this recording if you guys need to refer back to it it should be published probably by about noon